a storm is coming. In late April 1944, I was to return to 21st Panzer Division. In the weeks before, the division had been deployed to Hungary for a short time. It was feared that the Hungarian government could secede from the Axis. The intention was to prevent a second Italy, and so on March 19, 1944, a total of eight German divisions had marched into Hungary during Operation Margrethe. There was no trace of resistance, and Hungarian head of state Nicholas Horty, a former Kriegsmarine, Austria-Hungarian Navy admiral, was allowed to remain in office. In reality, however, the Germans took power by installing a new Germany-aligned government comprising Hungarian fascists. So, our Eastern allies also began seeing the signs of the times, seeking to distance themselves from the declining German Reich. They wanted to avoid the undertow of the coming maelstrom of death and destruction, but it was far too late. Whether on Germany's or the opposing side, the people of all European nations now had to drain the cup of sorrow to the dregs. After its return from Hungary, my division was relocated to the Caen area, the capital of Normandy. In early 1944, things still seemed calm in France. Some evidence of a coming large-scale Allied naval invasion was starting to corroborate, however. French resistance activities to prepare for such landings, along with intensifying attacks on French transportation hubs by Allied bombers, did not go unnoticed by German leadership and the Abwehr, German intelligence. In early summer of 1944, a storm was brewing in France, and I would soon witness its thunder. On May 2, 1944, I reported back to Lieutenant Colonel Rauch at the regimental command post in Thury Harcourt, south of Caen. From there, I went on to the battalion in Le Menil to my battalion commander, Major Zippa. He was visibly happy to see me, showing me the way to our company in person. We left the command post in a Kubelwagen headed for Chiron, a small village roughly eight kilometers northwest of Caen. My return was a pleasant surprise for all. They had not expected me to ever return to France. First Lieutenant Bratz greeted me as friendly as months before, and the men of my platoon were happy as well. Oberfeld Wabel, Master Sergeant Tanner, commander of the grenade launcher platoon and born Styrian, offered especially warm greetings. With him I had spent many hours of training exercises around Rennes, and we had always worked well together. My second in command, also a Master Sergeant, had led my platoon commendably while I was away, making sure that the soldiers remained highly capable and ever vigilant. By now, our 21 Panzer Division had been deployed to the French Channel coast, with all its formations ready. Here, behind the Atlantic Wall, it was to secure the important town of Caen, as well as serving as a powerful mechanized reserve force in case of enemy landings in this area. Construction of this Atlantic Wall had been started back in 1942. It reached from France all the way to Norway, stretching over more than 2,500 kilometers. The purpose of this defensive line was to defend against possible Allied invasions of the European continent. In France, development of the Atlantic Wall was overseen by Commander-in-Chief West, General Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt. Under his command were Army Group B, commanded by General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, as well as Army Group G, commanded by Colonel General Johannes Blaskowitz. Rommel was of the opinion that an Allied invasion could be defended against only if the troops landed could be thrown back into the sea within the first few days. Many of his measures were taken with this objective in mind. Although the Atlantic Wall had thousands of bunkers, its defenses lacked depth. To alleviate this, Rommel ordered the offshore channel banks covered with mined obstacles, which would hamper the advance of landing craft before they could even reach the beaches. In the hinterland, all open areas where gliders could land were littered with thousands of wooden stakes called Rommel's asparagus. All of these measures were under the watchful eyes of the Allies, who photographed each and every foot of the beaches, even sending out frogmen commandos to survey the obstacles planted in the sand. As such, German preparations and defensive measures were no secret to the Allies. In January of 1944, Rommel was eventually handed command over all German forces north of the Loire River. In this function, he was still subordinate to General Field Marshal von Rundstedt, 
and the two soon were in fierce disputes over where exactly the Allied invasion would happen. Their discussion mostly revolved around the deployment of the Wehrmacht's powerful armored formations. While von Rundstedt wanted to keep them deeper inland, Rommel pleaded for shifting them closer to the coast. Von Rundstedt's thoughts were largely based on the judgments of General Inspector of Panzer Forces, Colonel General Heinz Guderian, thus as well as Panzer Forces General Leo Geyer von Schweppenberg, both favored a massive counterattack of Axis armored forces well after Allied troops had landed. Rommel was quite judgmental of this concept. Well, Guderian and Geyer von Schweppenberg held the view that if the all-important mechanized formations were stationed closer to the coast, they would become too spread out since the location of the landings was still unknown. In the hinterland, Panzer and Panzer Grenadier divisions could be assembled for a concentrated push once the invasion commenced. Rommel, on the other hand, judged that the Allies would have air supremacy right from the beginning of the landings. Shifting large armored formations would then be hardly feasible. In North Africa, Rommel had witnessed firsthand how Allied air superiority could slow own troop movements to a crawl, thus paralyzing any offensive capabilities. None of these generals, however, was in actual command of the vital divisions. Hitler reserved for himself the right to approve commitment of these important formations. Rommel's attempts to call on Hitler were only marginally successful. On May 7, 1944, eventually, on order of Commander-in-Chief West, he received three powerful panzer divisions for his Army Group B to serve as its reserve, two and 116 panzer divisions, as well as our very own 21 panzer division. This assignment was only occasion-related, meaning only for deployment against possible naval invasion. For all other purposes, such as training and build-up, the three divisions still remained with Geer von Schweppenburg's Panzergruppenkommando West, Panzer Group Command West, this command in turn got its orders directly from Wehrmacht High Command, which in effect meant Hitler. An abstruse situation that left none of the people involved satisfied. At the very least, Rommel was able to independently command three panzer divisions on the occasion without having to ask the commander-in-chief West or Wehrmacht High Command for permission. This important fact was in compliance with his plans of an immediate counterattack. There was a catch, however— out of those three divisions, only the 21 Panzer Division was stationed close to the coast, while the other two were far behind in the hinterland. We kept on training our soldiers at Chiron and enjoyed the beginning of a French summer, which, as the locals told us, promised to become especially beautiful. We were just around ten kilometers from the sea, so we would go swimming there in our free time. We were largely exempt from having to partake in the massive fortification building at the Atlantic Wall, which was left to regular infantry divisions. Our regiment only had to plant some of Rommel's asparagus. Apart from that, we had only established a defensive perimeter of emergency positions around Chiron. Rommel was expecting air landings, so he insisted on all-around defensive measures in the rear as well. Our division's relocation closer to the coast had been a concession to Rommel. The area had not been chosen arbitrarily, Caen was seen as a vital industrial center, and it also lay at the River Orne, which went northeast from the town towards the Channel coast. Even if the Allies were to land at the Pas de Calais and not in Normandy, it was not unexpected for them to drop paratroopers in the latter region. Cayenne was a prime target for such an operation, since capturing the town and nearby crossing points over the Orne would make troop movements between the eastern and western parts of the coast practically impossible. Consequently, our Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192 was stationed north of the town and west of the Orne, while Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125 was northeast of Caen and thus on the east bank of the river. South of the town, finally, were the Panzer Regiment as well as the artillery and any other support units. Ahead of our division, directly at the coast, were the formations of 716 Infantry Division, commanded by Brigadier General Wilhelm Richter. This infantry division was tasked with defending the coastline itself. Its soldiers watched over the beaches in concrete bunkers and pillboxes, as well as operating machine gun, anti-tank and artillery positions further back. They had almost no mobility whatsoever. In theory, General Field Marshal Rundstedt, 
in his role of Commander-in-Chief West, was in control of almost one and a half million Wehrmacht soldiers, of which roughly 850,000 were part of the Heer army. In practice, the command situation was not that clear. Like the Panzer divisions, the infantry divisions had an abstrusely organized leadership. Rommel's Army Group B led the seven and fifteen German armies. Subordinate to Seven Army, commanded by Colonel General Friedrich Dahlmann, was 84th Army Corps, led by General of the Artillery Erich Marx. This corps, in turn, comprised six infantry divisions, with one of those being the 7th Sykstein Infantry Division in the Kahn area. The formations in which the infantry division's soldiers were serving, however, varied greatly in their combat strength. Of a total of 30 infantry divisions, the majority had only very limited transportation capabilities, with many also lacking in artillery as well as anti-tank weaponry. Since France was regarded part of the rear, many of the best soldiers had been relocated to the front lines in Italy and Russia. Around a fifth of the personnel of 7th Army were members of the Ostruppen, Eastern Forces, which were Poles or even Russian prisoners, that had been conscripted as Hilfswilliger, Kiwis, or who volunteered in order to escape a fate in the camps. I knew that many of the divisions stationed in France were only of limited combat value. The truly powerful formations in northern France were six Panzer and Panzer Grenadier divisions of the Heer and the Waffen SS. These even had potent Panzer V, Panther, and Panzer VI Tiger tanks. Committing these, however, would only bring success if we had air supremacy. But how were the few available Luftwaffe fighter squadrons to be coordinated? Rundstedt had no control over the Luftwaffe or the Kriegsmarine Navy. This would prove exceedingly detrimental to German efforts at the beginning of the Allied invasion, not to mention that neither Luftwaffe nor Kriegsmarine had much to offer in order to seriously oppose the Allies once they attacked. The forces available were simply too few. Within our battalion, discipline was first-rate, and there were no problems between us and the inhabitants of the small village of Chiron. Quite the opposite, we enjoyed almost friendly relations. My platoon was housed in a small chateau, with me living in a middle-aged couple's neat little house. I could walk through the chateau park and directly enter the backyard of my private quarters. My French hosts would even invite me and my NCOs to an afternoon coffee on multiple occasions. As such, we would spend many Saturday or Sunday afternoons sitting in this lovely backyard garden. The man of the house would often remark that while occupation is never a good thing, the demeanor of the occupiers determines the framework for living together. My host was right at that, and my comrades and I assured him that he had nothing to fear from us. Nevertheless, we avoided talking about the war or the occupation, and instead mostly discussed everyday matters with our landlords. After all, much more than that was impossible, since all we had to communicate were our small dictionaries and hopeful gesturing, this often led to bursts of hearty laughter on both sides. One of these afternoons we suddenly heard loud engine noise, and before we knew it, an airplane swooped over our heads only a few hundred feet above. We jumped to our feet and tried to get another look at it. The aircraft entered a steep curve and began to circle above the village. We determined the plane to be an Allied reconnaissance craft. Our 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun was not ready, and shooting the plane with MGs or even carbines seemed completely pointless to us. So we watched it circling and hoped for the arrival of our fighters. But nothing happened. As if he had all the time in the world, the Allied pilot photographed his targets, flew his loops and circles before eventually, after some seemingly endless minutes, turned back north. We were shocked. An Allied recon aircraft this far behind the coast, completely undisturbed by our interceptors. That was a harsh blow to our morale. The afternoon was ruined, and we were depressed enough to not want to look our hosts in the eye we left the scene. The humiliation was simply too great. In early 1944, American and British bomber formations attacked the German Reich from Great Britain without suffering too substantial losses. Time and again we received air raid warnings. Then we would observe the contrails of high-flying American bomber formations going east over our heads. Squadron over squadron flew towards our homeland, and the thought of what havoc their bombs might wreak there filled us with horror. American escort fighters equipped with external fuel tanks had emerged in the sky in early 1944. 
soon turning each interception by our own fighters into a suicide mission. In addition, there were barely any German fighter planes stationed in northern France. As such, the Luftwaffe could hardly do anything to oppose incoming and attacking Allied bombers. Up to that point we had been spared, but American bombers, protected by their escorts, had already started devastating transportation hubs as well as bombing larger troop concentrations here in France. Civilian casualties were on the rise, and we could see how the French themselves were also suffering under this intense bombing campaign. They most certainly had a different idea of how their liberation would look like. Bitterly they endured this fate, secretly hoping that the Allies would soon commence their long-awaited landing operation and bring the war to an end. Final preparations, me and my comrades used to discuss all the time in what area, if at all, the Allied landings would occur. Most were ready to bet on the area of Calais. Here the English Channel between France and Great Britain was the narrowest, thus making a ferrying operation the easiest to execute. Others argued for our position in Normandy because we would not expect it here. Most of our soldiers ultimately did not care where the Allied troops would land. Many hoped that it would happen as soon as possible, not because they yearned for the war to end, but because constantly waiting for the invasion to happen was unnerving. They were waiting for months by now. The soldiers wanted to lock horns with the unknown enemy, no matter the outcome. During these weeks Rommel was visiting his troops in Normandy unusually frequently. It seemed as if he had come to the conviction that the Allied landings would commence here. He personally inspected the individual defense positions at the Channel Coast, ordering changes and improvements to be made time and again. This did not always yield approval. The troop leaders already had enough of him appearing again and again, with his defensive measures keeping their men from commencing, in their opinion, much more important field maneuvers. On May 30th, 1944, he visited our division as well. To welcome him, parts of our regiment assembled at full strength in a small forest near Lebizet, north of Caen. Not in the open field, like in past times, but hidden between trees and bushes. This showed us all quite plainly what was going on with our air superiority. A company of Sturmgeschutzabteilung 200, Assault Gun Detachment 200, had been transferred to our area a short time earlier, so they were also set up along with their self-propelled guns. Then Rommel appeared, accompanied by our divisional commander, Brigadier General Feuchtinger, and his staff. Rommel went along with Feuchtinger, the latter showing the former each and every of our units, detailing the features of our battalion with the help of his staff officers as well as regimental commander, Colonel Rauch. I could also see a cluster of war reporters swarming around Rommel like busy bees, diligently taking photographs. We were standing mustered in full battle gear before our vehicles, waiting. Our men were wearing their steel helmets, we officers had field caps. Rommel took his time. You could see how he was especially interested in our adapted French captured equipment. Every type of vehicle was explained to him in detail. The self-propelled guns intrigued him the most. Then the time had come. He moved towards our company. Looking in his direction, I saluted. But it seemed that he had already seen enough. Purposefully, he marched past our company, meeting our gazes for a moment before disappearing again. Rommel's appearance instilled respect for him. He walked upright, radiating confidence and conviction, which was exactly what we expected from him during the harsh hours looming. As for me personally, I was a bit disappointed. I had hoped he would be especially interested in our Panzerjagerzug tank destroyer platoon. Whatever, I thought, waiting for my orders to reorganize and join up with the other units. The orders came straight away, and I ordered my crews to assume march readiness. We fired up the engines of our vehicles and rolled back towards our quarters. In the evening we learned that Rommel had been satisfied with 21 Panzer Division, but not with the expansion of the coastal defenses. Once again he had urged the responsible commanders to be more initiative and had ordered additional measures. When he was standing at the beach in front of the 716 Infantry Division, he said in front of the assembled generals, Gentlemen, I know the British from Africa and Italy and I tell you they will choose a location for their landings where we will not expect it, and right here, on this very spot, this will be. There is another small episode about Rommel's visit that I want to share. 
The photograph of Rommel, my crew and me, was later published in the Nazi Party propaganda journal Völkischer Beobachter. In 1944, this Völkisch Observer had a circulation of 1.7 million issues and was distributed in the whole Reich, of course including our home, the Ostmark. My beloved Helena discovered the photo of Rommel and us in the issue and was convinced that she had recognized me on it. My parents had come to the same conclusion, and together they wrote a note to the Völkischer Beobachter and asked for a copy of the photograph. And indeed, a few weeks later, my family received a letter from the editorial office containing several prints of the photo. I myself did not know anything about this story until after the war, when I was finally able to examine the photograph for the first time. On June 1, 1944, First Lieutenant Bratz, on orders of the battalion, tasked me with taking up an observation post with one of my guns on Hill 61, northwest of the village of Benouville and south of Colville. We packed the bare necessities, I loaded up my cubel, and after a short drive we arrived at our observation position, or as we called it, Bistel. From this observation post we had a wonderful view along the Cayenne Canal and the parallel river Orne towards the coast. That was why right next to us the command post bunker of the Infantry Regiment 736 was situated. Its commander, Colonel Krug, was responsible for the defense of this sector. From the town of Caen, the River Orne flows northeast directly towards the Channel Coast. Just around 400 meters west of the Orne, the Cayenne Canal lies in parallel, also flowing towards the sea. The distance between Cayenne and the sea is roughly 10 kilometers. A road, in parallel to the Caen Canal, leads from Caen over Benouville to Ouistraham at the mouth of the Orne. If you were to drive from Caen towards the sea, you would enter Benouville after five kilometers. Here, at the northern edge of Benouville, lies a T-junction with an additional road leading eastward over two bridges crossing the Cayenne Canal and the Orne River towards Ranville. The two bridges over the Orne River and Cayenne Canal, right in the middle between Cayenne and the sea, had enormous operational value. Between them and Cayenne there was only one other possibility of crossing the Orne and the canal at Colombelles, in the northern outskirts of Cayon. With the exception of these two locations, moving from east to west, or vice versa, between Caen and the Channel Coast was impossible. The two Panzer Grenadier regiments of our 21 Panzer Division, positioned north and east of Caen, were separated by the two streams, the bridges themselves guarded by units of the 716 Infantry Division. Upon examining the terrain in front of me, I immediately realized if the Allies were to land here in Normandy, the bridges northeast of Caen would be of tremendous importance and thus heavily contested. I was to end up being right indeed. But the time had not come yet. Allied aerial reconnaissance was active again that day, and covered by some bushes, we watched a British Spitfire recon aircraft flying low along the coast, from east to west. Bitterly we observed that today, too, this sortie went uninterrupted. Like earlier during our afternoon coffee party, our Luftwaffe was nowhere to be seen. On the next day we concluded our observation mission and moved back to Cairon. The time in this Bistel proved to be invaluable to me. Now I was able to fathom the importance of the Cane area. If the Allies were to land here, we would be right in the focus, which would be pretty uncomfortable. The following days were a slack period for us, but reports of French resistance sabotage acts were mounting. Time and again field cable squads had to move out in order to fix cut lines. In addition, the Allies had conducted excessive airstrikes on June 1st, targeting mostly transportation hubs and the bridges across the Loire and Seine. Something was in the wind. We could all feel it. On June 5th, we successfully completed a company maneuver in the close vicinity of Chiron. In the process, we observed that our exercise was eyed with interest by individual French civilians. We understood that each and every of our steps was noted down by the French resistance. Our defensive positions were not a secret either. All our minefields had been delimited by barbed wire and marked by warning signs the risk of civilian casualties was simply too high. Consequently, as expected, the French resistance knew exactly where our troops were deployed. Unable to change these circumstances, we resignedly acknowledged those civilians and focused on training our soldiers. D-Day In the evening of June 5, 1944, 
an armada of unprecedented size put to sea from British ports. More than 4,000 Allied landing craft, as well as 600 minesweepers, destroyers, cruisers, and battleships, started their crossing of the Channel. South of the Isle of Wight they assembled, sailing southwards under harsh winds and rough seas. Their destinations were the beaches of Normandy between Cherbourg and Le Havre. This sector had been chosen since the Allied leadership assumed that the Germans would expect an amphibian invasion at the narrowest part of the English Channel, on the French coast near Boulogne and Calais, thus investing less resources into the defense of Normandy, which lies further away. When the first bombs from enemy aircraft were detonating at Caen roughly twenty minutes after midnight, we were bounced out of our beds in Cairon. Dozily I rubbed my eyes while my runner, Lance Corporal Atanida, reported to me. Judging from his wide-eyed gaze, I could see that he was extremely nervous. I quickly put on my uniform, rushed into the garden, and gave a few initial orders, accompanied by the hum of enemy airplane engines above and the flashes of heavy explosions illuminating nearby Caen as bright as day. Within a short while my platoon was ready to deploy, and we began moving towards the rallying point of our eight company. Once there, we were ordered to simply wait for the time being. First Lieutenant Bratz had no clear overview of the situation yet a fact condemning us to remaining inactive. The humming of enemy aircraft engines above us persisted, and we could make out some of our own defensive fire. Tracer rounds were shackling the sky around us in long chains. Everyone was waiting, all tensed up. Everyone checked his gear and made sure that it was ready for use in the upcoming battle. Then eventually, after almost three hours of anxious waiting, our superiors managed to make up their minds. Bratz assembled us and relayed the battalion's order to U.S. platoon commanders. Company to immediately march toward Benouville, capture the local Orne bridges, and reconnoiter the unclear situation towards the coast. We had been waiting for this order on the edge of our seats. In an instant we had fired up our engines and were vigorously yelling commands. The men were hurrying, relieved by their time of waiting having ended. My three self-propelled guns formed the spearhead— followed by the rest of the company somewhat behind us. First the heavy mortar platoon of Staff Sergeant Tanner, equipped with three self-propelled eight-centimeter launchers on French carriers. After them came Bratz's company command and finally the anti-aircraft platoon of Sergeant Grimm. The latter was fielding three self-propelled Unic P-107 vehicles, equipped with 20-millimeter flak 38 cannons. Major Sergeant Goose, our company sergeant, stayed in Chiron for the time being, along with the logistics group. The unclear situation did not allow for taking them to the front. Communications with them were held up via motorcycle messengers. While moving towards what we suspected to be the front line, we noticed an increasing number of explosions coming from the coast. The Allies had begun bombarding the beaches in preparation for the amphibian landings of their soldiers. I knew that the situation could turn hazardous very soon so we had to move cautiously. Bratz fell behind a bit with the rest of our company, while my tank destroyer platoon slowly tiptoed towards Benouville, the three self-propelled constantly leapfrogging individual vehicles passing each other in their advance, while the stationary ones provide cover. In spite of the dangers looming ahead, I pressed my men forward until the southern outskirts of Benouville were finally in sight shortly before O4 Sound. We could make out the village roughly 330 yards ahead, the road leading dead straight towards its houses. To the left was an open field, with only a small hedgerow and a ditch lining the road. To the right lay a young forest with the trees and bushes of a park right next to it, the latter enclosed by a wall which also served as the road's right boundary. I ordered a halt and designated firing positions for my guns along the street, it was during this time that our nerves were strained to breaking point. Avoiding contact with the enemy and not getting caught off guard was paramount a conceivably difficult goal. Advancing into the village without fire support would have been pointless, as we could have fallen prey to an ambush by British anti-tank and machine guns. Getting our company to reinforce us was vital. I ordered my men to wait until the company's other units had arrived. After assigning a signaler, the rest of our force was soon closing up. Bratz put the anti-aircraft platoon left of the road to protect the open area, with my tank destroyer platoon next to it spread out along the road, 
enjoying additional protection towards the direction of the village. The heavy mortar platoon was set up somewhat deep in the forest to the right. Its mission was to bombard targets ahead of us as soon as they were detected. The sky above was imbued by the droning of bombers and the rustling of smaller aircraft engines. We looked up, and for the first time I could make out the silhouettes of airplanes, gliders incoming. Obviously the British had begun reinforcing their troops. Making the most of each hedge and every bush's cover, our guns took up position. During this I cursed their engines' loud noise. If the British had not already known of our presence, then by now they would. After a while all units had finally taken up their positions. Quiet set in again, except for fierce combat noise coming from the town's center. Obviously there was fighting going on in the village. Now that the rest of our company had caught up, we were able to advance further. I decided to form a reconnaissance party under my personal command in order to scout along the road leading into the village, protected by my self-propelled guns. After dismounting, I briefly informed my platoon as well as Bratz of my intentions and indicated the planned advance to my runners. Both of them had already guessed what was to come and stood ready. Keeping our heads low, the three of us sneaked along the right-hand roadside ditch until we reached a high stone wall the boundary of Chateau de Bainouville, according to my map. Both road and wall went on until their lines disappeared in the morning mist. It drizzled. I hoped for the rain to stay, because, if the weather was to clear up, dawn would soon give way to the sun, likely dissolving the last wafts of mist through its warm rays. Now, however, dense clouds were filling the sky, which was good for us, since it meant that Allied fighter bombers would have a hard time spotting us. I raised my hand and we slowly sneaked ahead. I decided to switch to the left side of the street, as the chateau's wall would have offered no cover against enemy fire. One after the other we leapt across the road. Along the ditch and a yard-tall hedgerow, our force covering us from behind, we stealthily advanced. The noise of battle ahead had ceased, and any detonations we heard seemed to come from far away. After around three hundred yards, the street had a crossroad. To our right, the park wall ended at a gatehouse while the denser house rows of Benouville lay straight ahead. The gatehouse with its half-round portal served as an entry point to the castle's park, a street bending to the right, leading into the garden. Suddenly I became aware of a body lying motionless in the ditch, near the hedgerow's end. While I could not recognize the patchy uniform, I could see that it was a British paratrooper, judging by the size of his magazine pouches. His unnatural posture meant he was dead. We had already come damn close to the enemy. But where was that enemy exactly? I suspected them to have taken the rows of houses in front of us. Tommy seemed to be waiting just for us. I could not make out any movement, but all was suspiciously silent. Sweat running over my forehead, I checked windows and garden hedges through my binoculars. There, I spotted shapes in patchy uniforms. They were running low along a hedgerow. That's got to be the British, I thought. Slowly I crouched back and signaled to my runners that the houses ahead had been taken by the enemy. I could see the tension in both of their faces. In the gardens ahead I could see more British soldiers. Here at the crossroad we were in an exposed position. The only cover came from the roadside ditch and the hedgerow, which was not taller than a yard. The droning of aircraft filled the sky with gunfire grumbling and bombs detonating in the distance. I rightly concluded that the British warships had begun their preliminary bombardment. The day of the landings had come, and it had come right here to our region. Flat and motionless we were lying in the ditch, and I compared our surroundings to the map I had brought along. Nearby explosions startled us. All of a sudden an engine revved and tracks rattled. Before we knew it, a German armored personnel carrier drew close coming from the town center, tearing past us at high speed. We caught a glimpse of its rear. Through open doors, several wounded could be seen, one soldier with a torn uniform lying between them on the floor. As quickly as the APC had appeared, it vanished again. I was hoping that my gun crews were to recognize the vehicle and hold their fire. To my relief, nothing happened in the minute after that. Behind us, no bang of my 75 millimeter guns and no impact explosion was heard. I decided to turn back. Our covering fire would not support us beyond this point. Advancing any further would have been forlorn hope, as we would have run straight into the arms of British paratroopers. 
but for the time being I wanted to get something out of the way. I wanted to leave this memorable moment to posterity. Beckoning at the needer, I doffed my steel helmet, drew my camera from its camouflaged cover, and asked him to take a picture of me. Baffled at first, he quickly understood, took the camera, and released the shutter. I stowed it away again, donned my helmet, and continued looking ahead. We went back as carefully as possible. Advancing into the village and towards the bridges with the whole company was pointless. Without adequate infantry support, our open-topped gun carriers would have been drawn into a murderous firefight with British paratroopers. Any combat inside the village would have been at their decisive advantage. A better plan was for us to hold the position we had already captured, meaning the southern village outskirts, as well as scouting through the park towards the Kaying Canal Bridge. Covering each other's movements, we eventually returned to my company's forward positions. Bratz was keen to hear my report. He acknowledged my view of the situation. As the retreating German soldiers had reported, the town's center was already chock full of British paratroopers, and they had barely been able to fall back after a short but intense fight. A situation which I could give confirmation of. The vigor with which we had taken our blocking position near Benouville, in addition to the success of my first reconnaissance patrol, gave me a good feeling about everything. Our men had chosen their positions meticulously, immediately camouflaging all vehicles from aerial view. You could only spot them if you already knew where they were. The rainy weather persisted, and with the beginning forenoon we anticipated bad weather, which in turn protected us from possible air attacks. With the heavy mortar platoon ready to fire, Bratz ordered Oberfeldwebel Staff Sergeant Tanner to take up an observation post in the front with one of his runners. Before they left, I briefed them shortly, imploring my good friend not to go beyond the crossroad. The houses behind there were already in British paratroopers' hands. Staff Sergeant Tanner took a telephone with him, and after a few minutes we heard that British paratroopers had been spotted at the crossroad which I had scouted up to. So they had slowly advanced towards us, calm and collected, Tanner relayed coordinates for a fire attack. Shortly afterwards, the distinctive roaring of our heavy mortars sounded behind us. This gave us confidence. We could hear the grenades exploding in the village. We're not defeated yet, I thought, listening to our observers' reports. The first shells had already been on target, immediately driving the British into the houses. Now they knew that they were watched. In the following hours, our two forward observers set the pace of everything happening. As I had found out earlier, the most advanced British positions lay near the crossroads. These were now being shelled by our mortars. Time was of the essence in this situation. British paratroopers had no heavy weaponry, so their defensive measures were only effective inside the confines of the village. Even then, they could not hope to resist a massed German attack for long. A vigorous push would drive them out of their positions. Preparing for a possible attack of our own was imperative. First Lieutenant Bratz had already reported our observations of the enemy and this possible opportunity to battalion command. The only response, however, had been an order to hold any captured ground. Enemy activities were growing progressively. Battle noise coming from the coast was getting louder and louder, with ever-increasing numbers of explosions. We knew that time was running out. Still, we could not do anything. An attack with our small force alone would have been doomed to failure. We could not hope to make it far. Time passed, our mortars fired, but there was not a single sign of a counterattack of our own. Shortly after noon, a sudden alarm message came from our forward observers. Enemy tanks ahead. I promptly hurried to the most forward of my well-camouflaged gun carriers, which was guarding the road towards the village's center. Before my Benouville reconnaissance endeavor, I had ordered my gun commanders to fire at will upon identification, and when I was rushing towards the vehicle, a muzzle blast tore through the air, followed by a violent explosion. The whole gun carrier jerked backwards. I climbed up the board wall and immediately received a status report. On the road ahead of us, roughly three hundred meters away, two M4 Sherman tanks had appeared. One was fired upon my men, causing the other to reverse out of sight again. I looked through the glass pane. And indeed a Sherman was standing there, engulfed in bright flames, a thick pillar of smoke rising from the wreck. This meant the British had already brought up tank support into the village. We had scored our first kill. 
I gave the gunner a pat on the back, but promptly had to think about Staff Sergeant Tanner and his observation team in the front. After a few minutes, I could see two figures scurrying through the roadside ditch. Tanner was returning from his observation post with the other observer. Still panting, he gave a report. Upon arriving at the crossroad, he had spotted the British paratroopers through his binoculars, directing our mortar fire on their positions. After the first hits, they had vanished, so he proceeded ordering curtain and harassing fire between town center and bridge, based on his map. A few minutes later, an elderly man had appeared on the street, limping towards him and stopping in front of the hedgerow in which he was hiding. After looking in their direction for a short time, the man had turned around, limping back to where he had come from. Staff Sergeant Tanner was unsure what to think about this, until a sudden burst of engine noise was heard, and two British Sherman tanks were coming from the direction in which the man had vanished, tracks clanking and barrels lowered and the vehicles were slowly crawling along the road towards their position, one offset to the side behind the other. Tanner and his subordinate had cowered low in the ditch, not even thinking of crawling away. As the noise of the tank tracks was growing louder and louder, they had heard a crackle of gunfire, the shell detonating a few yards in front of them. When they had already seen themselves being overrun by British tanks, the one in the front had burst in a gruesome explosion. My anti-tank gunners had done a good job. The second Sherman had stopped abruptly, rolled back, and disappeared behind a house. Tanner and his observer poised shortly before hurrying back in our direction as fast as they could. They had been quite lucky. After this British tonk advance, I went to First Lieutenant Prats and recommended sending a comeback patrol through the park and the chateau therein towards the canal bridge. The map showed a small ridge to the north of the chateau, sloped in the same direction, towards the Orne Channel. This would be the ideal, elevated position for our weapons to support a counterattack through the village's center. Bratz gave permission, I grabbed both my runners as well as one of the gun commanders, and the four of us began advancing towards the park. Instead of a wall, the southern edge of the park was delineated by a tall iron fence. Sneaking along this fence, we found an iron gate after roughly a hundred yards. This gate was open, so we entered the park area and worked our way forward towards the Kong Canal. Before long, we were standing in front of the chateau, which lay at the left bank of the canal. The chateau itself was a big, multi-story building, towering over the park, thus promising to offer a good view over both Orne bridges. Securing each other's movements, we crossed the open space between the forest edge and the chateau, running towards the main entrance, which was surrounded by impressive columns. Gasping for air, we entered the building when we suddenly got startled for a moment. A French middle-aged woman ran towards us, yelling and flourishing wildly. We were all puzzled, did not understand a single word, so we just did not respond, charging further into the building. Standing in a great staircase, I wanted to risk taking a look from the roof, so we rushed upwards. When we had climbed half the building's height, all of a sudden hell broke loose around us. The glass of the large windows shattered, large-caliber projectiles battering the walls. Glass shards, splinters of wood, and fist-sized chunks of the walls got sprayed all over the place. I quickly peered out the window, and to my surprise, in the middle of the canal I saw a small vessel showing the war insignia of the Reich at the stern. Our own! They're thinking we're the enemy, I thought. I shouted, Move! Move! And we hurried to the top. The staircase behind us looked desolate. That had been a close one. Looking around, I needed a window to the north. When I opened a door and we entered, the next surprise was awaiting us. We were standing in a whitewashed hall full of hospital beds, several nurses in white, facing us, huddled together and staring at us in fear. Now we realized the chateau was being used as a hospital. I was amazed and shocked at the same time. That was something I had not expected. I could not remember seeing a red cross on the building. For a moment I looked at the ground awkwardly, but composed myself again. I put down my submachine gun, raising my hands in an imploring manner, hoping to not appear threatening. The nurses and patients were still eyeing us in anxious silence. Holding my hands up, I turned my head and approached the window, taking a look outside. As I had expected, the view from the chateau over the canal bridge and the houses of Benouville was great, 
a perfect observation position to direct our heavy mortars. I witnessed two impacts at the bridge, seeing jets of debris rise up. Our mortars were performing blind, harassing fire. I took a look through the binoculars, and sure enough I could see movement coming from the coast over the bridge. Those had to be the British. Lined up in long rows, one after the other, they moved along the canal, coming from the shore towards the crossing, armored vehicles between them, aircraft above them. It was a fantastic and at the same time depressing sight. We could see a mighty stream of enemy soldiers and their war material pouring in from the coast. When we were looking through the binoculars, the events unfolding before our eyes seemed like a fata morgana. I just had to take another look. The spectacle was simply overwhelming. Our position at Chateau de Benouville would have offered a superb view to direct our mortar fire, but without hesitation I abandoned that thought. This would have violated international law of war. The British would have found out where the spotters would be hiding in no time, and all hell would have broken loose here. As a matter of fact, the British opened fire on the chateau multiple times during the day without causing severe damage or casualties among the patients. Suspecting artillery spotters and sharpshooters inside the building, they used a German 7.5-centimeter anti-tank gun captured at the bridge to flush out any such foe. Just as we were running up the chateau's staircase, a Vorpostenboot, patrol boat of the German Navy, had opened fire on the building. After coming from Caen and attempting to close in on the bridge, the vessel came under fire from the German anti-tank gun captured by the British paratroopers. The crew had turned their craft around, unloading their two-centimeter cannons at everything that appeared like a possible enemy position. Apparently they had seen us moving in the staircase and opened fire. We had only realized that the four-poston boot was there when its two-centimeter flak shells were hitting everything around us. Already in the morning, shortly after the British landings had begun, two four-poston boots from Caen had actually sortied along the canal towards Uistraham. Close to the canal bridge, they had been shot at by British paratroopers, Piat, projector, infantry, anti-tank weapons. This led to one boat running aground and its crew getting captured right away. The second vessel had disengaged, and in the afternoon, just as we were moving towards the chateau, its crew attempted another recon sortie towards the bridge, probably to also look for the other boat and its crew. In the process, the vessel again came under defensive fire by the paratroopers near the bridge. Our Vorposten boot's subsequent fire during its retreat past the chateau had nearly claimed our lives, a small episode of military history which almost killed me and my three men.